Um, I'm going to start by kind of, um, I've got three main things that I really want to cover. Um, firstly, I want to start by talking about um, the idea of disability and research. And this is going to be um, kind of unashamedly personal, um, mainly because my work and the reason why I'm here doing this is inherently personal. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and how, how research around disability um, and medical health issues has kind of impacted on my life as, um, as a disabled person and as somebody who is sometimes a patient. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to talk about the, the kind of individual impact and what I think the kind of the community and the, the political impacts of, of research might be, um, kind of based on my own experience. Um, I'm then going to kind of summarise um, um, what the Mental Capacity Act says about research, because as people probably know, there's a little section buried in the Mental Capacity Act that specifically deals with um, participation in academic research and in clinical research for people who lack the capacity to consent. And so I'm going to kind of summarise that um, and then hopefully finish by just basically putting out there what I think my questions, my thoughts, my concerns, my issues might be um, about those, about the MCA and research and how it relates to kind of my position and my thoughts that will be kind of starting points for hopefully discussion later on. So that's what I'm aiming at today. So starting, as I say, personally to think about disability and research and how this word of research, um, literature, um, clinical research, however you want to frame it, how I've kind of experienced it and how it's kind of impacted. Um, I come at this from kind of two perspectives because I sort of divide my disabilities or my disabled identity into kind of two halves, the kind of physical and the autistic. Um, so when I'm talking about my experience personally in terms of research, I'm talking about these kind of two perspectives. So firstly, um, I have uh, physical disabilities, um, musculoskeletal condition, um, there, are, there are kind of Two, two halves to it, but um, I have Madeleine deformity and Larry Wilde dyschondrosteosis. Um, these are very, very rare um, musculoskeletal conditions caused by the mutation or, in my case, the deletion of, of a gene and some related de um, genetic material. Um, so, and it, as I say, it's incredibly rare, um, special and, and rare. And um, so that's the first part. That's the kind of the physical part of, of when I talk about disability and research. Um, I'm also autistic. I have a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome. Um, and I have very strong interests in autism research um, and how autism research impacts on autistic politics and autistic community. Um, so those are the kind of two halves. When I talk about research and its impact on me, those are the two sides that I'm thinking of. Um, and I've put kind of too little research or too much because... As I've said, there are these two halves um, to my experience of disability and research. And in relation to the first half, um, as I say, I have um, unpronounceable, very, very rare um, musculoskeletal conditions. There are about 50 of us in the country who have the condition that I have. Um, and there is virtually no research on it. Um, there are some very dodgy clinical x-ray pictures um, Jed, I think there's somebody at the back who needs a Ooh, seat so and needs to be welcome. Yeah, yeah. Hi, it's nice to see you. <laughs> we, yeah, we started only a few minutes ago. Um, so um, there is virtually no research on it. So I got my diagnosis. I got my first diagnosis when I was 14. And obviously one wants to find out about what's going on with one's body. And there's virtually nothing. And at that time, there was very little in terms of like um, online community, online patient activism. Um, so there's nothing. Um, and I'm told that it's a condition that only affects my arms, so I don't need to worry about any other part of my body, just my arms, but there's nothing. And this becomes a problem because um, in my actual real life, when I'm not being a patient, when I'm being a school pupil, or when I'm being um, a pianist wanting to take exams, or when I'm being somebody who has this issue going on with my arms that I need to navigate in my life, there's virtually no research on it. So when it comes to things like um, wanting to get adjustments for exams, wanting to get um, what used to be a statement, what's now an education and healthcare plan um, for school, 
there is virtually no research that actually says authoritatively what my condition should be. Um, there was also, at that point, the definitive clinical um, opinion, as I mentioned, that, that it's a condition that only affects my arms. Um, and that's important because going through my life as a person whose whole body kind of um, um, experiences pain, experiences um, muscle contractures, experiences spasms, experiences all kinds of other funky digestive issues, all that kind of stuff. My condition only affects my arms, right? So how do I explain all the other stuff? That's just, that must just be me. I must just be weird. Or I must just need to try harder at life because there's clearly nothing wrong with me because there's no name for it. So this idea that I'm getting at is that with having very little research on one's own condition, there is very little that's authoritative that one can actually draw on to articulate one's own experiences of, one's own embodied experiences of life. So trying to talk to a teacher and say, this hurts, trying to talk to um, somebody who's going to give me a statement within the local authority, um, there's nothing for them to look up to say, there's nothing for doctors to say, this is what it is, this is how it should impact this person. Um, it's kind of very isolating and it's um, quite disempowering. Um, and actually, subsequently, um, the second diagnosis, the, the Larry Wilde diagnosis, um, I, got, um, I got later in life. And this was when genetic research had moved on in 10 years to find that there is actually a link between the arm stuff and all the rest of the stuff. Um, so now I'm authoritatively told that there is something wrong with me. Um, there's still no literature on it. So... Um, there's still, and actually, um, as a kind of anecdote to explain how this kind of authority around research works in a patient experience, um, I went to my uh, clinical geneticist and got my diagnosis, and I wanted to discuss pain management, and she looked blank. And bearing in mind, she's never seen an example of my condition before. Um, she's looked it all up, um, so she knows the condition. She's looked up what it says in the textbooks, um, and she says, oh, it shouldn't cause pain. Um, there's nothing in the literature that suggests it causes pain. It causes pain. Now, by now, there's a whole Facebook group of quite a few of us all over the world who are saying, this hurts, that hurts, I can't do that, I can't do this. How do we manage this? How do we manage that in our everyday lives? But the geneticist, who is the person who writes up my diagnosis and gives me the letter that I can then use supposedly to access accommodations, thinks that my condition doesn't cause pain. And in this situation, there's an authority or a power imbalance whereby she gets to say what my condition is. She gets, she gets authorship of my own embodied life experience. Um, so, yeah, um, kind of whose truth, whose authorship, whose body, um, what counts as important, um, who has kind of epistemic authority um, around who writes what in terms of clinical research and its impact on people's actual everyday lives, um, not just in a clinical sense, but also in a, health, in, a, in a social sense, in an education sense, in an employment sense. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about how having something where there's no research can sort of impact on, on one's life. Um, I mentioned as well my other condition, I have Asperger's syndrome. Um, as people probably know, there is an awful lot of research about autism. Um, I meant to look up, I know I've seen the figure of the actual amount of registered studies that are ongoing on autism at the moment, and it is phenomenal. Um, it seems like if you want to research something that you think is interesting um, in science, if you can slip the word autism, this is possibly a tip for researchers, like if you can slip the word autism into your proposal, it seems like anything goes at the moment. There's, there's a lot of research about autism. Um, and this is the stuff that like, really impacts my, my life, my politics, my community, my friends' lives. Um, it's kind of a big deal because, again, what gets written in research um, impacts on how we authoritatively talk about our own um, experiences, whether it be that we use research to um, support what we experience or whether it be that we're actually saying, no, that's not how it is, or no, that's not important, or why the hell are you researching on mice? Um, it's something that impacts, it has an impact on our actual everyday um, discourses, our lives, our political agendas, um, and things. So, yeah, lots of research. I said too much, question mark? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, 
But um, thinking about things in preparation for this talk, I was thinking about the idea of research and autism and my kind of opinions on it. Um, and for myself, I've, I came up with what I think of as my traffic lights approach. So when I hear about something, or when I read something about um, a piece of research on autism, um, I think it probably divides into traffic lights in the sense that I have the red light, which is like absolutely horrendous, horrific, why are you doing that to autistic children? Um, so there was, one, there was one thing recently where um, lumbar punctures had been repeatedly used on autistic children. I can't remember what it was to measure, but the, the, the test was, was lumbar puncture repeatedly. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever had a lumbar puncture here. I, I haven't. They're, they're horrendous. Um, they are incredibly painful, um, potentially dangerous. Um, and this same study reported that the, on the healthy control children, um, the lumbar puncture wasn't used because it wouldn't be ethically appropriate. So if you're an autistic child, you can go through that treatment. If you're not autistic, it's not ethically appropriate. So that's kind of one of the things that would fall into my red light category. Um, the other one is the kind of the red light of what does that research do to help our communities and our social world and our experience actually in the world, our social lives, what does that do? And I guess um, I mentioned autistic mice. If you check out the hashtag autistic mice, um, there are some really funny examples of, um, and it's become quite um, tongue in cheek. A lot of the time when autistic people start tweeting things like this, it becomes very, very sarcastic. Um, and so yeah, research around autistic mice, because apparently you can make mice autistic um, and then somehow make them not autistic. Um, you're not making them not autistic, you're making them behave in a way that is apparently more socially acceptable. Apparently mice are, you know, the, it tells us a lot about our own social lives, apparently. Anyway, so that's my kind of, my, I guess my red lights, things that I just think that doesn't fit with me and my own views as a, as a stakeholder in this community and in this research environment. My, I guess my amber lights, I'd say, are probably things that, you know, in a kind of pluralistic research world are things that, yeah, I can see why people are doing them. They're not the things that I'd want to do. Um, they're not what I would think of as priorities. Um, they maybe say something about our health. They may be about interventions. Um, I can possibly see the use to them, but they're not what really float my boat, and they're probably not where my skills are. Um, and then I've got my personal green lights, which is where I read things like um, ethnographies of autistic communities, and I think that actually gets to it because that actually gives us a way of authoring our own experiences. Um, that actually validates our experiences, that gives us something to communicate with each other about, um, that actually kind of helps us. Um, so that's how I kind of <laughs> approach when I see research that actually impacts on an aspect of my life. I guess that's how I describe it. And interestingly, um, some of these issues come up in the, in the research that Liz Pelicano did in 2014 because there was a survey done of research priorities among um, autism stakeholders. So this was the autistic community, uh, parents, carers, family members, advocates, um, and also researchers of various types. And the striking finding there was that there was a, a distinct mismatch between the research priorities of the communities, which were very much about, um, about social life, about... Um, about the kinds of adjustments, about the kinds of things that actually help people in their daily lives, um, and the research that was actually being funded, um, which was probably more what I might have talked about in my kind of red or amber traffic light system. So what I'm getting at there is that there's, there's a kind of mismatch between the research that's being done and the research that, that particularly, a particular community affected by that research um, feels is important and feels is going to impact on their lives. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about where I'm coming from and how I think about research in terms of disability and how it relates to disability activism. Um, what does the Mental Capacity Act say? Well, I think that we're going to hear more about this this afternoon anyway. I'm sure Julie will touch on it in particular. Um, but yeah, as I mentioned, that part of the Mental Capacity Act deals with um, research and, and participation in research if people... Um, lack the capacity to, to consent. The important bits are um, Section 30 um, sets out the requirements for gaining um, ethical approval. Um, 
One particularly interesting bit that I spotted was uh, section 31. If a person is going to participate in research and they lack the capacity to consent, there has to be a link to the impairing condition, which is um, the condition that is associated with their lack of capacity. Um, so it might be that a person has dementia or it might be that a person's autistic or has a learning disability or a brain injury. Um, and that is the reason for which, um, that is, that is the, the sort of the justification for their lacking of capacity. Um, interestingly, or certainly interestingly sort of from my position, as a person with disabilities who participates in research around my disabilities as a way of having an impact in the world and in the disability community, um, that link is quite important because the link wouldn't be there if I were to lack capacity and there were research to go on about some of my rarer physical conditions. Um, so there are, there are kind of issues there around that link and sort of what research we think people would participate in if they lack capacity. Um, the objectives of the research have to be not achievable by researching with capacitous participants. Um, and that kind of made me think about the idea of um, voice and representation and whose voices in research we might be interested in hearing. Um, because um, I, can, I can appreciate the protective aspect of that provision that, you know, we might be concerned with people being treated as, as guinea pigs and exploited in research. Um, but on the other side of that, if we think that representation in research is an aspect of a, of a person's voice and their participation and their contribution to the wider social world, um, and, we and we prioritize that experience for capacitous people um, before people who lack capacity, I, I wonder if there's a conversation to be had there around how we, how we interpret that. Um, there's a provision for the role of family members. Um, so if a person lacking capacity is to be considered for participating in research, um, there's a process of, of consultation with, with family members who, who know the person um, and who um, speak to the person's kind of prior and maybe present wishes and feelings. I think Julie might touch on that later. Um, that might be part of her research experience. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in there is maybe... Um, the idea of prior wishes and feelings and those wishes and feelings being known by family members. Um, so the thing that occurred to me was that for people who um, prior to losing capacity um, are disabled, have disabled identities, have opinions about the kinds of research that they value, maybe have a similar traffic light system to me, if that's their identity, their politics, it would be a good idea to maybe have a conversation while a person has capacity, um, part of a kind of advanced care planning process that maybe indicates the kinds of things that are valuable to that person in terms of research contributions and what disabled people actually would like to be involved in. Um, there, are, um, there are additional safeguards in section 33 which includes um, the idea that research participation for a non capacitous person shouldn't um, go against anything that was included in an advanced decision that the person might have made, for example. Um, and a provision that says the interest of the individual must be assumed to outweigh those of science and society. Um, and one thing that I was interested in that, that again is a, is a thought or a, a question that came into my mind was um, it feels quite individualistic and I think certainly for some of us um, maybe our disability politics and our wider politics are maybe more concerned with social identity and with the social world um, rather than our individual clinical pathological experiences. Um, so I think there's maybe an issue of framing there um, about what we think this kind of research is doing and what some of us as disabled people with an interest in disabled politics might have as priorities. Um, so yeah, that's a very brief summary of the MCA and research. Um, the code of practice actually mentions um, why, um, why, we, why the code of practice thinks that... Um, that uh, research is important and why this, these provisions around participation for non capacitous people are important. And it says, it's important that res research involving people who lack capacity can be carried out properly. Without it, we would not improve our knowledge of what causes a person to lack or lose capacity and the diagnosis, treatment, care and needs of people who lack capacity. Um, 
the emphasis, the underlining of our knowledge was mine, um, that's my emphasis, um, because our knowledge really struck me, um, because it made me think kind of whose knowledge, um, it, it made me think, um, it, it feels to me like this is about research being done <coughs> on people um, to improve the knowledge of capacitors people about how to improve, for, for example, diagnosis, um, treatment care needs. Again, it's, it's kind of, <coughs> it feels individualistic. It feels um, almost kind of guinea pigish. Um, and it struck me that that didn't really sum up what I think of as research, as research um, priorities in terms of um, voice um, and kind of using research um, as, a, as a mechanism for, for kind of political resistance um, for people to actually own for themselves um, and to kind of have an impact on the world. Um, so I would question whose knowledge, who do we mean by our knowledge? Um, one thing that it does mention in the Code of Practice is that the idea um, that the opportunity to express one's views in research, so for example, if the research involved interviews and the person had the, had the opportunity to talk about their own experiences, um, that could be seen as being of real benefit to the person and that might be a reason for, um, that might be a sort of ethical reason for the person participating in research, that it might have some individual benefit for them. Which made me think actually, um, that maybe we think of participation in research in terms of having a kind of value, um, that there's a value to the person in terms of the participation um, enables them to have a voice and to talk through their own experiences. Um, maybe we think in terms of rights, um, and certainly this is kind of, this is something that's been kind of important to me, um, probably in terms of why, um, why I've always worked in um, disability related research, why that's been part of my activism, why I'm here doing a PhD, um, because my feeling is that um, research um, literature impacts on my life, um, it has a power in my life, um, and to me, um, I value the right to be, um, to actually have a say in that. Um, there's lots of discussion, particularly in the autistic community, about um, particularly the right to participate because um, some particularly kind of clinical autistic research um, kind of gatekeeps in terms of the uh, diagnostic frameworks it accepts for research participation in terms of the types of people um, that are defined as autistic and as able to have a voice in autistic research. Um, some people have been excluded because they're not autistic enough or because they're, you know, they're too political so they can't possibly be autistic because they actually have an opinion about the social world and that can't possibly be autistic. Um, and that is a power. That is a power um, that has an impact on the world. Um, and actually for myself, I kind of want to have a say in that. Um, so I see that there's a, there's a rights issue there. There's, um, there's a power about how we shape communities res with research, how we define them, how we, uh, the kinds of discourse that we use around them. Um, and it kind of concerns me that... Um, or I think we need to be thinking about that in terms of the Mental Capacity Act and in terms of what that says about who can participate in research, about what, what research they can participate in, um, and, um, yeah, about how their, their wishes and feelings could be, um, could be represented. Yeah, I'm good, I'm really finished. Um, and I've just forgotten my, my final point. Um, I think the final point that I would say is that... Um, I think when we think of, or when I've read about the issue of mental capacity in research, um, it's quite easy to see it as a, as a kind of um, a dichotomy between sort of protecting individuals, protecting vulnerable individuals from being exploited, being treated as guinea pigs. Um, and obviously we know that a lot of that, a lot of the ethical concerns in the ethical literature comes from history, um, comes from eugenics, um, comes from... Um, fascist exploitation of disabled people. Um, and on the other side, there's, this, there's, the, there's the side that I've spoken to, there's the voice aspect, the representation aspect, um, the right to kind of have authorship over one's own experience and to Im Im influence the social world um, by speaking to academic research and by having a voice in that way. And I think it's easy to set that up as a, as a kind of um, a specific kind of dichotomy that we only discuss this in terms of um, 
the Mental Capacity Act and those provisions that I outlined. Um, one thing that I would really like to see would be um, that these kind of issues, these kind of concerns about research become part of the wider kind of considerations of disability liberation and disability politics um, so that we, we address the issues of why we need to protect people, why people are seen as socially vulnerable, why they're conceptualised in that way um, and that hopefully we can think about not necessarily obviously being mindful of the kinds of safeguards that we need to have in place but also being aware of where we'd like to get to, um, kind of um, the kind of um, maybe the moves forward that we might, might like to see kind of politically and socially um, so that actually people can have a voice um, without the risk of exploitation.